This evening we're doing something slightly different. We often do a monthly webinar uh, for our candidates, but we wanted to do something a little bit um, broader and a little bit different. So we're bringing together our co-founder Lucy Kellaway and also Catherine Burblesing and also John Blake, who's going to be hosting us this evening for a broader conversation on education. Um, there will be an opportunity for a Q&A later in the session, and uh, so please do submit your questions via the Q&A panel that's at the bottom of your screens. Um, so I will just leave those polls up there and I will hand to John to introduce himself and then on to our other guests to introduce themselves too. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much, Lindsay, and uh, hello, uh, everyone, um, and uh, thank you for, for joining us. So my name is John Blake. Um, there is now another large photograph of me on the screen, just in case you were unclear whether I was an imposter or something. Um, I uh, am currently... Um, the Head of Public Affairs and Engagement for ARC, um, a charity many of you may be familiar with, which uh, it's the lion's share of what it does is run ARC schools, multi-academy trust with uh, 39 schools in London, Birmingham, Hastings and Portsmouth. But we also support a number of other charities, including uh, having incubated Now Teach um, before it became fully independent. Uh, and during that time, I also worked for Now Teach as uh, Director of uh, uh, Policy and Strategy, um, and uh, I am also just to, to make to show a further interest in, in the topic of the discussion. I, I will be from January joining the higher education regulator, um, the Office for Students, um, as director for fair access and participation. So I will be uh, looking at the extent to which we we are able to ensure that all young people can access the higher education uh, that, that meets their aspirations, needs, and achievements. Um, uh, one of the um, pieces of instruction that I had when I uh, joined that, the sort of one of the pieces of guidance from the department for, for the OSS is that is that I've got to spend more time talking to um, the Social Mobility Commissioner, um, uh, which is enormously convenient because uh, she's here. Um, so hello, Catherine. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Um, I'm just going to ask, um, rather than me uh, spieling on their um, various uh, skills and abilities, ask them to introduce themselves, our, our guests to introduce themselves. So. Um, Lucy has temporarily disappeared from my screen, so I will uh, uh, ask Catherine uh, to start. Um, uh, so Catherine, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about uh, yourself? Um, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing the same dress. You are, that is amazing. <laughs> Which is just a bit weird. But anyway, <laughs> that wasn't done deliberately. I didn't... <laughs> That's so funny. Anyway, um, yes, well, I'm Catherine Birbel Singh. I'm, it says on the screen, I... I, I um, co-founder and uh, headmistress of Michaela, our school in Wembley Park. It opened in 2014 with uh, year sevens and we're now all the way through. We had our last, our first cohort go to university this summer and recently was made the chair of the Social Mobility Commission as it says. So I've just started that. I, it's just a few days a month. I'm still very much headmistress here. Um, and uh, I do that, you know, they, why did I decide to do that? Well, I thought that it would just uh, give me a bit of a larger platform, I suppose, to talk about the things that I think are important um, and to get, you know, a bunch of commissioners together and look at the kinds of ideas that um, I think have been very powerful in enabling social mobility, you know, here in our community uh, in Rome. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, Lucy, are you are you there? We may have temporarily lost Lucy. Right. I apologise. So we, no, we, we, we won't be getting the votes in. from the Norwegian judges. We, we might come back to that uh, a bit later. <laughs> a, a joke that is literally only funny to people who watched the Eurovision Song Contest in the in the early nineties. Um, niche, very niche, John. But yeah, I, I like to I like to keep it niche. Um, but well, what I will do then is uh, as, as we try to recover uh, Lucy. Lucy, are you there? Are you? Nope. No, I think I think let's go ahead. And let's we'll let's proceed. Um, then we'll we'll circle back. So um, well, it's, it's just just you and me then, Catherine. So I'll uh, I'll just kick and start with that. So I think um, I just want to start with. Uh, Actually, one question, which I think uh, is quite interesting. When you introduce yourself there, you call yourself the headmistress of Michaela. And that is an unusual term now, certainly in the state school sector. 
do you want to sort of why, why did you make that choice why did you keep that title why was that important to you um in in founding the school and how does that feed into your your sense of the role of the school and what Michaela was was setting out to do within the school system yeah it's a, it's a good question um well headmistress headmaster are much more traditional head teacher is more modern um and we wanted to be more traditional we are very much a traditional school and um we've been very loudly traditional uh, and we encourage people to come and visit us and see what we do here. We've tried very hard to persuade uh, people in the educational establishment of uh, our sort of uh, methods, teaching methods, disciplinary methods, uh, values, uh, belief in tradition, um, uh, in, in trying to sort of show, look, this is what you can achieve in the inner city uh, or in any kind of challenging circumstance with children mm -hmm. um, if, if you kind of stick with tradition. I think, um, it, it, well, I was about to say traditionally, but traditionally, more, more in the more recent uh, past, traditionally, it's been the case that people believe that at, in order to have success with uh, children from challenging backgrounds, you need to do a more modern thing. And uh, I would argue that actually, that's just, I would disagree with that and say that in, in fact, uh, you will have far more success with them if you stick with tradition. So that's why I'm called a headmistress um rather than a head teacher <laughs> okay uh Lu lucy look oh, gone again um lucy you there this Good is going to be a recurrent theme hilarious. we lucy? are still working on getting her back john i'm afraid um so for now it is just you yes and all right well so, so talk to us then about what so you talk about tradition there could you describe what you know what does that mean what what are the traditions that michaela is um, embodying. I'm sure many people might be familiar with them, but you sort of chat through and I think distinguishing between you talked about traditional discipline and I think traditional subjects sort of are are those things quite distinct? Do you think it's possible to have a school that has quite a traditional discipline system but a much less traditional curriculum and yeah. vice versa? Um, I think it would be quite interesting yeah. to, to have a sense of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, good question. Um, yes, of course you could. Um, I would say that the discipline is absolutely key to whatever kind of school you have in terms of the, the curriculum and the subjects and so on. And um, while I think it's great, our traditional subjects of, you know, English, math, science, French, religion, geography, history, uh, we 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 are very much an academically focused school in that sense, and we do lots of lots of what I've just said. Um, I you know I'm I'm less sort of wedded to that. I mean I'd understand a school that decided to do to have a different sort of curriculum, but the behaviour issue, the discipline issue, is 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 like that's that that's a no that that's that's a non negotiable for me. <laughs> if if you want your school to work, you've got to have high standards of discipline. Um, you've got to have uh, consistency across your staff, you've got to um, have high expectations of the children and then have systems that will enable the children to meet those high expectations. So you've got to support them in doing that, you've got to love them, and care for them, and I would say a demonstration of love is holding your standards high, that we often think that lowering our standards is somehow to show the children love, and I'd say it's quite the opposite, much harder to hold your standards high, much easier to just let them get away with stuff because then you don't have to give them the detention, much more difficult to give the detention. So, um, yeah, I would say that that's a, a, it, it's, it's a non-negotiable, it's absolutely key because otherwise teachers can't teach and then children don't learn. And then the most disadvantaged children are the ones that suffer the most in the class because they're not managing to keep up with the learning because they can't make up for it at home. They don't get tutors at home. They don't get mum, dad who talk about the politics of the day around the dinner table. They don't have the books at home to be able to start reading uh, because they, they didn't really understand what was going on in the lesson. Um, they, don't, they may have parents who don't speak English, lots of brothers and sisters who are disturbing their learning at home. They're depending entirely on their school uh, to bridge that gap for them. And so without discipline, the, the school I would argue is unable to do that. So, um, yeah, from that perspective, but we are also very traditional in terms of uh, our teaching, not just the subjects, but also our way of teaching. So we teach explicitly from the front of the classroom. We don't consider ourselves to be facilitators of learning who move amongst the desks and keep the children on task. Instead, we stand at the front. 
the adult is very much the authority in the room who is leading the learning rather than it being more of a child-centered learning thing where the children are leading the learning. Again, I would say that this is um, the most efficient and most um, productive way of teaching and ensures that children who perhaps are far behind when they join you from primary school are able to catch up and are then in a position to go off to you know, the top universities later on when they hit 17, 18. Um, I'm sure any, anyone in the audience who's, who's heard of you or, um, or the school or follows your uh, always exciting Twitter feed will be aware that, that, that uh, this is not a, um, this is not an approach that has, has, has met with universal acclaim, uh, let us say. So, I mean, do you understand why some people are cautious, let's, let's put it much wrong there, about what you're doing? And you know, do you do you see any validity in, in their argument or uh, the, what do you think is the source of that argument? Um, what, why, why are people skeptical and, and, and do you see, do you think there's any legitimacy to, to some of their, their sort of critique? Okay. So yeah, again, very good question. So uh, what happens is this in somebody's head is that they think back to school and they think, gosh, I had some really boring teachers where they just talked and talked and talked in front of the class the whole time. And I was bored and I got myself into trouble all the time. And then I didn't pass that, le that class or I didn't do as well as I could. And wouldn't it be so much more exciting if we made learning much more relevant and engaging for children? And how do you make learning more relevant and engaging? Well, instead of learning your verb tables in French, you might do a French rap. Or instead of um, reading Shakespeare, which is really hard to access for a black kid in the inner city let's read something that's more modern and more about the where he lives and the kind of lifestyle that he has and then he'll be more engaged with it and um all of that is really well-meaning and uh and you can see why you think well why would the kid this kid identify with shakespeare was so far removed far better to identify with something that's based in his in his culture here but i would say that the problem with that is that that means uh, the rich white kids at Eton get one kind of education and the poor black kids in the inner city get another type of education. And the problem, while I have nothing against the more modern authors, and I always point out that I am one, one of those more modern authors, um, and while I am a modern author, I would never argue to teach any of my books <laughs> over Shakespeare in the classroom. And the reason is because Shakespeare has been influencing literature for 400 years. And therefore, when you, and not only just, I mean, influencing literature, so much of our cultural references, are various that you won't even realize, are come from Shakespeare. Um, that if you don't really know him, you are at a disadvantage in life. And while the teacher in the moment thinks that they are being compassionate and being making it more interesting and more relevant and exciting for the child, in fact, in the end, the child is put at a disadvantage. So, I mean, that's one example with that. There are other, why give, so uh, detention for not having a pen, for instance, that's something we would do at school and people say, oh my goodness, that's so mean, why would you do that? Now, when we don't, when we do that, uh, one needs to remember that we do everything we can to make sure that they do have a pen. There's a little shop in the morning that they can buy their pen for 10p from. The children will know the rules inside out, so do their parents. Um, the parents have all been told and yeah. explained about um, uh, have, helping their pack yeah. their bags before, the night before, so they have their pens. And this rule is then um, uh, applied to all of the children fairly across the entire school. So you never hear the children saying, that's not fair, that's not fair. Now, there's some people who say, but it's very mean to insist that they should bring in a pen because what if they've just forgotten it? It's not a big deal. And I get that. I do understand that. It isn't such a big deal. But when you think about that compounding over years, that the child doesn't really understand how to get himself organized and how to prepare in advance the night before, Oh, you there, Lucy. <laughs> Lucy has appeared. I don't know if everyone can see her on her screen. She's now there, but she's also on mute. So we've, we've got you, Lucy. I think we've just got you muted, though. Can you unmute me? There we go. OK, yeah, we're good. <laughs> have just unwittingly provided so much amusement to my senior member of staff because my it wouldn't work on my uh, computer in the classroom. So I was running out saying, help, 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 I'm meant to be doing this thing. Anyway, I'm in his office now. That's his notice board behind me. Well, 
so sorry, Catherine and John, to have missed everything you've been saying. No, well, certainly speedy promotion there just by seizing an office from someone. That's that's very impressive. Catherine, do, do you just want to finish that? I think if you finish that point and then we'll, we'll come back to, to Lucy for a bit of an introduction from her and perhaps a counterpoint. But um, but but please, I think it's I mean, I particularly I think that that question of. You know, a, a child who's from perhaps a, a home where it's very it is very disorganized, it is it is perhaps difficult and they've not got a pen, you know, how how do you do it? I mean, because you talked earlier about love, and, and I should say to everyone in the audience as well, I've been to to Michaela and I I am uh very strongly persuaded of the enormous affection for which the, the students are held in by the staff. So this isn't asked in a sarky way, but how how do you justify that for, for that young person coming from a very different background that, you know, they're going to get a detention if they haven't got a pen? You know, how all does, and how do they respond? All of our children leave us knowing how to bring in a pen. Not only that, but they leave us knowing how to make sure they're properly prepared for the interviews that they're going to go for. And they're prepared to apply to the right kinds of uh, jobs and universities and so on. And they're hugely, hugely successful. And in fact, the local colleges and various other places that they go off to, all of them comment about, Oh, we've got a Michaela child because he always turns up on time. You'll never, you always spot the Michaela child turning up at this college because he always sits up straight. Isn't it weird? The Michaela children always bring their equipment. And so these are habits that you are instilling in children over time. And um, for us to kind of uh, poo poo the idea of, oh, well, who needs a pen and who needs to turn up on time? The thing is, is that you get fired in real life when you don't do these things. <laughs> and um, our children won't be in that position. So the, the, it's not the first of all you know getting a detention who cares it's 20 30 minutes of doing a bit of work what do you do I, mean, I don't understand what the big deal is and then they learn and then the next time they bring in their pen and then they keep bringing it in until eventually they're no longer doing it because they want to avoid the detention they're doing it because that's just who they are if they climb the pyramid we talk about climbing the pyramid so at first it's oh i want to avoid the detention then it's, oh, I want to get a merit. Then it's, oh, I understand this is good for my future. And by the time they get to the top, they're bringing in their pens and turning up on time, not because they have to remind themselves of, of to do it, but just because that's the person who they are. And that's what our jobs are as parents and as teachers. We are gradually pulling the scaffolding away, every now and again, putting the scaffolding back in and helping them till eventually you take the little birdie and you say, off you go, fly and the bird can fly without us supporting them. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. So Lucy, um, obviously before you became a teacher, you were uh, a journalist, a profession um, perhaps not famous for turning up on time or necessarily being massively well organized, or How indeed- dare you? I, yeah, I'll come, come now. But also uh, certainly a profession filled with people who, many of whom are inherently suspicious of authority and dislike um order and and uh and instruction things like that so i mean perhaps do you want to talk about uh your obviously your own experiences but also perhaps um think a little about what catherine said there and what your take on that is and 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 how as you've entered uh the profession uh perhaps you've you've thought about that sort of particularly that disciplinary function yeah i mean you're absolutely right john i mean I, you know i'd never taken any instructions from anybody until i was very nearly 60 years old i went to a very groovy freewheeling school had an utterly groovy time as a journalist went to work then at mossbourne which shares some of the um same sort of approaches to behavior as michaela does um and at first i was profoundly shocked you know my inner liberal was saying, you know, what are we doing? What, why is all this walking around in silence? What, you know, what is all of this about? I felt really quite uncomfortable at the beginning. But then what happened was that the longer I spent in that system, the more I really understood why they were doing that. Um, and, and, and I do agree with Catherine that, that actually, if bringing a pen in is something that you have to do, guess what, the kids actually do it. I also agree with her that giving them a detention isn't the end of the world either. In fact, I wish they cared rather more about detentions than they appear to. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on board with all of that. Um, I, I've now moved um, to another school where they do it a very different way. Um, so I'm now at, at Mulberry School for Girls in Tower Hamlets, which is another very, very successful school where the approach is really, really different. And they get um, girls to behave through making them want to behave, which is sort of the ideal. I suspect it's very, very much easier because of the demographic of the, of, 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 
of the school. They are all girls. Um, they mainly come from very traditional Bengali families. So the school has very few traditional behavior problems anyway. But watching it done in a very positive way has been a lovely thing, although quite shocking to me, because I find that I can't wash, wash moss born out of my hair entirely. And so I'm from being the biggest hippie at Mossbourne, I'm now the biggest disciplinarian at, at, at my new school. So I guess that there is, for me, I think there is some sort of wonderful halfway house, but Catherine, please forgive me if while I was being incredibly incompetent, you've already said this, but what I wondered was, you know, yes, I'm on board with especially some of the children who are in your school, what you offer them is really beneficial to them, not just through their education, but through their whole lives. Um, where I'm slightly uncomfortable, I know you've said quite often that you don't have a single middle class child in your school. I'm slightly uncomfortable ab about the idea that, um, you know, the middle class kids don't need all of this and they can go off and have lovely sort of just be happy, darling, sort of the sort of Camden School for Girls creative education that I had, whereas the kids who are already disadvantaged by dint of their, um, you know, their families and their birth have to go to schools where it's like the blinking army. Um, there seems something that's gone slightly wrong there. I wonder if you see it like that at all and what your answer would be. Well, lots of gone wrong. Lots of our children never got read to uh, ever. Uh, they certainly, you know, they, they didn't get read to. They won't have come across books until they get to school. Um, when they go home now or all their lives, nobody talks to them. Um, they are given phones from a very young age and stare at screens. Uh, lots has gone wrong. They arrive at school chronologically, in terms of their chronicle, chronological reading age, far behind their peers, some of them. Um, they, some of them, many of them, we have to teach them how to hold a fork and knife because they've never done it before. They don't know what it is to have a, a conversation across the dinner table. So lots has gone wrong and there's mm. huge amounts to uh, catch up on. So, you know, when you visit some of these um, uh, private schools, they cut down on the amount of maths and English that they do. They can do as time goes on, they're doing less and less of it. And they do more and more sport in some of these top public schools. Uh, take your piano lesson whenever you want, but you're never allowed to interrupt games or PE because it's the most important lesson. Um, but they can do that. Uh, we of course could not because if we were taking our children out of the English lessons, they wouldn't pass their English GCSEs. And there's a reason for that because we're trying to catch them up in terms of reading. So. You either think to yourself, well, English isn't that important, so don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter if they know how to read. Of course, when huge numbers of, of children in nationally are leaving school functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate, then something needs to be done about that. No, I completely, I, I, I agree with that, but isn't there a small part of you that does think that this is a sort of behavioral apartheid, which is a shame in itself, that the kids who already won the birth lottery go to schools where they're treated more like adults um, and have, a, a, in some ways, a more benign school experience. Whereas the kids who, as you say, may not be able to learn to, may not already know how to use their cutlery, have never been read to, but they have to be in this miles more um, sort of rigid environment. Well, because you're seeing rigidity as something that's horrible and I don't. Our children are very happy and they feel loved and actually, I feel very sorry for those children mm -hmm. in the private schools. Um, I don't, I, I look at those private schools and think, gosh, they could be so much better. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> they could be mm -hmm. so much better and they could be pushing the kids so much more and teaching them so much more. I often feel sorry for children in these schools because they've got to depend on their parents to hire tutors for them because they're not being taught properly in their mm -hmm. lessons. They have mm. to depend on their mums and dads to take them to the museums and so on. Now, our children aren't going to get that at home. So we've got to make up for that in the lessons. So we have no time to waste. We have got to spend that lesson time efficiently. The private schools can be a lot more relaxed about that because somebody's going to make up for their mm. uh, inefficiencies in the classroom. So it doesn't really matter. I don't see their learning as being creative at all. I think their learning is stunted, actually. And I think if private schools were doing their jobs properly, the children would be learning far more than they actually are. In fact, what they do is they turn out with with sevens eights and nines and i sort of think well why aren't you getting you know far beyond that and they're not you know because they're not doing that great a job actually i mean the fact is that 
the fact is that my staff are extraordinary and the children are really happy. And being in an environment which is ordered and structured, especially when you come from an environment that's particularly chaotic, is a joy. You know, if you ask our children what they, you know, they'll all tell you from the, the best behaved to the, the, the naughtiest ch child, they'll all tell you they really like it. They enjoy it. Um, so it's an assumption that they're somehow unhappy. They're not. Children like order. And I would argue that for all the, any parent knows this. Any parent at home knows that children who have a dinner time, they sit down and they sit around the table and they eat with their parents at the same similar time and they expect certain types of food that come out and they know how it's served out and they know they're expected to have a conversation. They go to bed at a particular time. I mean, it, it, the, the, the family that just allows their child to go to bed at any old time, to be on screens until two in the morning, uh, who never talks to them. I mean, none of these are good things. These, these no. are bad things. So mm. I, I don't, you know, ultimately, I think it's, um, it's a, it's a, it, it's not just a misunderstanding. We like the romanticism that we imagine is happening in this creative atmosphere. Creativity comes from structure. When children are in, a, in an environment which is predictable, which is safe, that is when they can push the boat out. That is when they can think outside the mm. box. When they're scared that the other children are going to laugh at them, that the other children are going to um, uh, uh, think of them as being the teacher's pet and so on. When you haven't created a culture which um, uh, values learning and promotes high achievement and so on, then everyone is aiming for the for the lowest common denominator and that is not a good thing now of course if you're in an environment where it's selective and you've got a particular kind of intake whether that's um you know as you were suggesting in your school now or even more so let's say at eton where it's highly selective then you can sort of get away with being more relaxed but being more relaxed is not necessarily good um it means you learn less and I don't know why learning less would be a good thing. I mean, you can get away with it because the parents can make up for it at home, but why should the parents make up for it? Why shouldn't we be doing our jobs as teachers and teaching them as much as possible in the classroom? Well, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone everyone was here for what I should I'd imagine will be next week's Twitter storm on Catherine's uh, timeline on uh, private schools failing to, to take advantage enough of their... Uh, of their opportunities. Um, we've got some questions coming in through the Q&A and I will go to those in a minute, but just before we go on, I mean, obviously um, the last 18 months, two years for all of us have been extraordinary. Um, and I would appreciate sort of thoughts uh, from both of you about how your schools have approached that sort of extraordinary disruption, you know, the first time for 140 years that all you know, the majority of school aged children have not been in school um, and what consequences you think that's going to have on um, on young people and on on the role of schools in the next two years, five years, ten years? Is are we going to have to do something different? Do we need to do something better? Do we need what what what's been the impact and what's likely to be the continuing impact? Um, Lucy, if I start with you and then then go to Catherine. Yeah, I mean, the things that I'm going to say are, are very, very well known. We absolutely, every single teacher in the country saw how unevenly this fell. And um, that um, the kids in my class who I was not worried about at all before lockdown, I continued to be not worried about. In fact, I became even less worry, worried about them. They were learning absolutely brilliantly online. They were doing all the tasks and sometimes more that they were set. I'm slightly irritated. They, they seem to be learning even more without my assistance with it, which was a little bit upsetting. But um, all of the all of the children who I was already really worried about engaged so much less well. Um, you know, all, but, you know, we 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 know all of this. But where are we now? Well, um, uh, you know, we're, we're all trying, and we're still trying to fill the gaps. Um, I, I've taken on a year 13 A-level class and there are vast swathes of things that they should have known in year 12 that they just jolly well don't know. And so, you know, all of the catch up is very welcome, um, but I think that there's only so much that we can do. As for what, what have we learned from this, I dare say we have learned a lot of stuff about trying to do more blended learning. Um, I mean, for me, though, the main lesson is that there is no substitute for what actually happens physically in a classroom. That's maybe that's partly selfish. And that's what I love about teaching. 
actually, and I never managed to um, create that online, anything that I thought was even slight, even half as good. And it has even people who are not necessarily world's most brilliant with technology, um, as you might say, we had had evidence for that earlier, um, earlier this evening, even I'd like to say it wasn't my fault, but anyway, um, we do all know that there are ways that technology can make learning more efficient. And there are certain things you can do with homework. There are certain things that you can do with uh, sort of posting resor resources online that really do make, that should make a, a, a teacher's job easier and a student's job easier. So there are things that we've learned there, but the overall message for me is that, that being in a classroom is absolutely brilliant and you can't replace that. And also that um, there are still wide gaps that have not been filled. Brilliant, thank you, Lucy. Catherine? Yeah, well, I would agree with all of that. I mean, essentially, uh, you know, the more disadvantaged you are, the less likely you are, probably, not always, but probably, to be able to access much learning um, online. Um, if you've got uh, a mum at home who's standing over you and making sure you're doing everything exactly as being, as being said, then you will be better off. If, on the other hand, you don't, then it's entirely up to you. What happens in the classroom, what, to just explain what Lucy was saying there, the reason why she won't have been able to teach as well online is because a teacher in the classroom is holding the children to account all of the time. They're peppering questions around and making sure that they're following. And then if they realize the kids aren't with them, then the, the, that testing for understanding allows them to reteach. And then they can test again for understanding. And then they say, right, we're going to do a quiz on this. And the kids are constantly on, on, on you know, they're just on their toes thinking, gosh, I've got to perform. Uh, when you're online, you have no way of being able to hold them to account. They are essentially falling asleep in many situations that I've heard of elsewhere. People, you know, the black boxes are there. You don't even know if the kids are there. They've logged on. They then disappeared. So no one's holding them to account for their learning. So it was an absolute nonsense, I think, all of this business of just pushing out all these laptops. I mean, I sort of understand mm. why government did it because they were under a lot of pressure and they need to be seen to be doing something. But essentially, you push out all these laptops and say, the problem is, as Andrew Adonis was saying, um, all the private schools are giving these Zoom lessons and the state schools are not, and this is so dreadful. Um, and, you know, we gave Zoom lessons, but the fact of the matter is laptops weren't going to solve anything. If anything, they just gave children more opportunity to get on Snapchat and on Instagram. Um, and no one could understand the idea that laptops are actually undermining learning as opposed to giving access to learning. So you cannot be a good teacher in the classroom. It's the only way children to learn. If you want to catch them up, then the best thing you can do is get good behavior happening in our classroom. So my position on this is that all this idea of, oh, we're gonna have all these extra lessons and so on. Look, the fact of the matter is we simply need to use the time that we've got efficiently. And I come back to my original point, which is that if you have great discipline in your schools, great discipline in your corridors, and you're getting into your lessons quickly, and you've got great teachers standing up the front, leading the learning authority in the classroom, and the children are learning loads, we would catch everybody up across the country quickly and efficiently, and without, frankly, spending any money. But <laughs> That And no one's willing to do that. So instead, we talk about how we need all this extra funding, et cetera, for all these extra lessons. And we're going round and round and round. And meanwhile, the disadvantaged children are, uh, the divide has never been so great between the privileged and the disadvantaged as it is right now. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, one of the questions that's come in, and I think this, this sort of comes up to something that you, you touched on earlier, Catherine, about the idea that Michaela is a, a deliberately very academic school. Um, and I think Lucy, you've suggested that, uh, that, that that's, that's also a focus of your current school. Um, how, how do we best go about supporting young people with vocational aspirations then? You know, obviously we've gone through a very long cycle in this country of various uh, attempts to do this. Um, you know, we had a grammar school system that divided the academic from the non-academic. Um, we've had more recent attempts in things like the university um, technical colleges to, to inject more vocational technical work. There's now the T levels. Um, can I ask both of you just to sort of think about, you know, to talk about how your respective schools do support uh, those and and what you think the future of, of technical and vocational learning for young people were, is or ought to be? Catherine, could you start us on that? Yeah. So I think the role of secondary education is to give children a basic uh, academic uh, uh, knowledge on you know they need some basic understanding of geography of the world and of their country same basic history of you know an understanding of the basic history of their country they need the good to have a little bit of a foreign language if possible certainly some basic english math uh, english and maths 
Lots of children, as I say, leave school nationally without basic English and maths, and they are functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate. That is a travesty. Um, then once you've done that, you've got to age 16, well, there are all sorts of colleges that you can go and do a variety of different vocational subjects. I don't think that's appropriate for them to be doing lots of before that and then falling behind in English and falling behind in maths and leaving school functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate, which happens far too often. So when I talk about how our children do very well uh, in various colleges, lots of our kids go off to a variety of different B techs and, and, and vocational courses uh, uh, around here. And they do extremely well. And they do extremely well because we've taught them how to turn up on time and how to bring a pen and how to be ready and listen and so on. And, um, and so they've had that training, I think, which is what secondary school should be doing, which then puts them in a very strong position to be able to do whatever it is they want afterwards at age 16. Thank you very much. Lucy? Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, in my school, there is an academic focus, but we also have a few classes of, of girls who are doing BTECs. Um, but I feel that we've got slightly out of balance. And when I say we, I don't in my school, I think in general, that too many students are um, sort of in encouraged towards the A-level route when it doesn't, when another route would suit them much better. So I just don't think that the balance is right. And I've seen that in some of my own classes. But you just think, hang on, this isn't the right thing for them to be doing. There's got to be a better way of them actually using the skills that they have. I completely agree with Catherine that those basic skills that you're teaching them, they need, children need those to succeed in whatever they're going to go on to do. So I'm also in favor of, of until 16, that they are taught a sort of broad, um, broad range of things. But it doesn't really seem right to me that, that um, you know, I think I'd like to see A-levels as more of an academic route and a lot more funding and money and thought going into all the rest of it um, and making these higher status things for um, children to do. Actually, Mulberry one, runs one of the few really successful UTCs, which possibly in Catherine's book begins a bit younger than, than you know, maybe or maybe not. I don't know. These things should begin more at 16 than, than, than earlier than they do. But to have more courses of this sort that more students do and with, um, with more status attached to them. Because I, I, I just think the balance isn't quite right at the moment. Thank you. Could I, um, and another question that's coming, I'm going to take both you back, or not back, but to, to the other end of um, the spectrum from young people who've got all the qualifications they need to make the choices they do and, and think a little bit about those young people who, for whatever reason, find themselves outside of the school system because they've either been temporarily or permanently excluded from schools. Um, I'm interested in, you know, what you think the offer is for those young people. Is it, and perhaps why they've got there, is it that, that their, their schools have failed them or is it that actually they need something different? Um, uh, is there, is there a, a commonality between these different, these, these young people who end up excluded or not? So I'd be sort of interested in, in your, your take on who, who, as it were, doesn't make it to the end of, of secondary, with, certainly not without substantial disruptions. Perhaps we could start with Lucy and then, and then Catherine. Yeah, I'm not world's leading expert on this at all because um, I only see the kids who are still in. And what I can say from the schools that I've worked with is that they bust the gut to keep the kids in conventional school if they possibly, possibly can. Um, I mean, I know Mossbourne had the reputation of sort of, you know, getting rid of anyone who was even slightly troublesome, which actually really, really wasn't true. They tried to keep them within. And I think I was only aware in all of that time of one student who was um, permanently excluded. And yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, and so and, and what the, and what went on to happen to him, I have no idea because then my involvement with him ended. So I really, 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 really don't know. So I think Catherine can probably answer that better. Catherine. Yeah, well, what happens to them is that they go on to what's called a, a pupil referral unit. I mean, well, I suppose that's more old fashioned term, um, alternate provision. And um, they might stay in there for a while. And then uh, what tends to happen in the councils is that they have a panel where they will then place that child into another school. So uh, people sort of think of permanent exclusion as the most awful thing ever. But actually, it means they go into the alternate provision and then they go to another school. And it gives them an opportunity to have a fresh start somewhere else. And I suppose the idea is that you 
put them in another school and maybe they've sort of learned their lesson and they will try and do things differently. And so, uh, uh, you know, and that, that, and there's a kind of understanding amongst the schools that they, they, you know, you take one this time, okay, we'll take one that time and so on. And there's this kind of exchange that goes on. Um, now, some children at that point, perhaps they've tried one school then they've tried another school and they've got permanently excluded from both. And so sometimes they will just end up in the alternate provision. But the thing about the alternate provision, I mean, and I think, you know, I don't think that, I, I don't think this necessarily needs changing. The system I think is as best as it can be. Uh, alternate provision uh, kind of schools get lots and lots of money in comparison to normal schools. They'll have far fewer children. So they might have 40 children or 50 children in the school. Um, and then they have far you know, fewer teachers who are then able to give much more one-to-one -one support. Uh, and to try and get them through to to their normally to their GCSEs, um, and I think I, I you know I'm not sure that there's anything you know I'm highly critical of so much in education. I'm not so sure I'm critical of that uh, process. Um, it's a difficult thing, but there needs to be a system which allows children to be excluded if necessary, um, and the system does work very hard to keep them in. As Lucy said, schools desperately try and keep children in their in the school to begin with. Then if it ends up sadly with a permanent exclusion, they go to the alternate provision and then they're put into another school to give them an opportunity. They might even have another opportunity after that to try another school. So the, the system is working very much in such a way to try and keep them in school. Yeah, yeah. another question that's coming about uh, special education needs, which I think someone's leads on from that, not because uh, SEND necessarily leads to exclusion, but we do know that students with special educational needs are disproportionately excluded within the system according to their numbers uh, and someone points out that um, you know we've, we've seen substantial real-term cuts in the funding for education generally and you know in particular um, you know the the you know I've uh, I've seen cases of, uh, of you know councils that are essentially just claiming they just don't have enough money to fund legally required SEND services um, you know, what's what's been your experience of that? I mean, how are, you know, and, and particularly, Catherine, I'm interested in how young people um, with special educational needs, do you find that they need a different uh, treatment to, the, to your usual classroom practices? Or do you just align them with everyone else? And, and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I would say, for instance, uh, that all the things that I'm talking about help precisely those sorts of children who normally would end up on the outside of classrooms, you know, so the SEND kids or the, uh, you know, poor children, children who come from more difficult backgrounds, anyone who's got difficulties, um, they in, in benefit enormously from the structure and order and clarity that they get in an environment that I would say is more traditional. Um, and that's why I say that that such an environment is filled with love, um, because those children then are not, they're supported. The, 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 the order and structure is scaffolding things for them so that they are not, the, the culture of the classroom is such that it holds them in. Um, people often think of um, traditional uh, teaching and discipline as always punitive. It's, it, yes, there is the, the discipline side of detentions, but it's more about a culture which supports the children in doing the right thing so that they just are different when they're in that classroom as they might have been, say, when they were at primary school. They actually change the people who they are. They're different people here than they were somewhere else. And I think too often in the West, we imagine that we are just the way that we are and there's nothing we can do about it when actually there is. And we as adults can influence the way a child is um, to become somebody who's able to sit properly and who's able to engage with the teacher and do the work and so on and so forth. And that you, that anyone can do that, even the SEND kids. In fact, they'll do it even more so when put in that, the right kind of environment is what I'd argue. Thank you. I mean, Lucy, what's been your experience of this? Yeah, my experience is slightly different. It's just not enough money. And that, um, well, I, I mean, I agree mainly that, that, that the kids who I have taught who are on the SEND register are some of them, in fact, most of them are hugely soothed by routine 
and by knowing exactly what it is they're expecting. Some of them, I have taught a couple of students who have found those routines very, very difficult. But, but putting that to one side, the problem is just not enough, not enough one-to-one assistance. It's practically impossible to get um, one-to-one help. And, and if that help is good as it so often is, I've seen students benefit from it so enormously to have somebody sitting with them in lessons, particularly when they're younger. And actually, this isn't my experience. This is my, um, one of my sons has recently become a primary school teacher and he teaches seven-year-olds. And, and he's in a perfectly normal primary school in East London. And he has five autistic children in his class. Um, most of them are too young for a diagnosis yet. And it takes a very, very long time to get one. Um, so what a primary school teacher ends up doing is instead of at the end of the day, um, either marking or preparing lessons or going home to lie down, you have to log every single behavioural incident in order to increase the chances of getting funding. So he spends an hour every day minutely logging incidents in order to try and help get what seems to be practically non-existent funding. That doesn't seem to me the, uh, uh, an, an, uh, a story about a system that's working brilliantly. It's interesting, someone else asked a question that I think perhaps follows on from that, just sort of, um, I mean, there exists a body within English education whose job is to go around schools, taking a look closely at what it is they're doing and telling them whether they're doing it uh, well or not. Um, and, uh, that's probably the most generous description of Ofsted uh, ever ever given by a teacher. But um, what are your experiences of Ofsted? Do you think Ofsted has a uh, a, a useful role within the system? Um, uh, and if if it doesn't, what what is the? I mean, the the defence of Ofsted is often that it is um, valued by parents that they want to know what's going on. If 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 that isn't quite working, what, what, what is the thing that needs to be there to ensure that schools are accountable to parents? Uh, I'm going to start with Lucy to, to, to let Catherine really build up a head of steam about Ofsted. <laughs> okay, well, luckily, I've never actually um, been Ofsteded myself, although I'm in my five, fifth year now as a teacher. I seem to have avoided that, but my current school, we're, we're expecting one any minute now. Um, I now feel that I've more or less got the hang of teaching, so I personally feel bring it on. Um, actually, my senior colleague is laughing in the background. Uh, <laughs> I realise just how hellish it's going to be. Um, look, what concerns me about this is the way that um, it's so high stakes for schools. And therefore, that you it's just like the sort of thing, as soon as you start measuring something, whatever it is, it starts to mis, you know, to misbehave and misperform. So, so we, you know, we now know that Ofsted is looking at a more broader, its new framework is broader. I think that's good. But what does that actually mean? So I've spent had to spend um God knows how much time writing schemes of learning, which I don't really don't think is a good use of my time on the grounds that this is what. Ofsted allegedly wants to see. So I think whatever it is the schools think Ofsted is measuring, they're going to misdirect resources into that with the result that um, you often don't get the best outcome, which is every teacher spending every second in a way that's productive for the children, which is to educate the children, which is what we are actually trying to do. However, do I think that Ofsted should be abolished? Definitely not. I do think that um, schools are accountable because what they're doing it ought to be accountable what, what, because what they're doing is so important. Um, I think that they should be checked. Maybe that that sort of outstanding label should be abolished. You know, I, I so I, I'm not sure. I haven't been in it long enough to, to to really know. I think how it's working at the minute isn't brilliant because we spend time doing things that don't matter. Thank you, Catherine. Views on Ofsted? Yes. John says it like that because I'm well known for saying that I don't like Ofsted and I don't like Ofsted <laughs> um, and it's not that look the the reason I don't is Lucy sort of said what 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 my issues are really and and, it, and she's talking from a teacher's point of view from a head's point of view um head teachers are constantly chasing after Ofsted and it distracts them from doing the job 
Mm -hmm. um, you're not able to think about what your school really needs because my senior teacher is nodding in the background. I right. <laughs> yes, all you're doing is for trying to figure out what Ofsted wants. And the thing is, because it's an inspectorate and it kind of depends on who's running it and what what their thing is at that moment in time. And then next year it changes to some other thing. You know, you're, you're never quite sure. So I think people on the outside think, well, there's an inspectorate and they're very good and they know what good schools look like and they go in and they tell you whether or not your school is good or bad and that's a good thing but that isn't actually what happens what happens is as i say there are different trends and different whims that different ofsted uh, heads will take and they go off and do this and they do something else but what's worse i'm not even criticizing ofsted it's the existence of an inspectorate so it means that the senior leaders are all just chasing ofsted thinking how can we how can we do what ofsted wants and it, it distracts them from doing what's actually right. And then it's the same, as Lucy said, even with the teachers. And so you're not able to focus on what you should be focusing on. And then people, I mean, the stories I hear of people, the CEOs of trust going in and telling school, I'm, I've heard from head teachers who say, oh my goodness, I'm being told my behavior is too good. We've got to make the behavior worse because otherwise Ofsted will fail us. Or we've got completely insane things that head teachers and senior teams are doing because they're thinking that's what Ofsted wants. And no matter how clear Ofsted tries to be, uh, there will always be nonsense that's spoken about what Ofsted ought to, you know, wants. And so in, in no one's ever able to concentrate on what they need to concentrate on. Now, Lucy said something interesting because people then say, yes, but Catherine, schools must be held accountable. Well, accountable for what? If you're holding them to account, you know, so I was told many times before we had our Ofsted um, by the Department for Education because we we're a free school and they wanted us to do well as a free school. And they said to me, you must write your three year plan. You must write your uh, self evaluation form. You must write this. And I said, no, I'm not writing any of that. And they said, but why not? You might get a four. We want you to get a one. And I said, well, there's something wrong with the system where I could get a four, but if I write a document, I might get a one. And um, they said, yes, but you've got to, you've got to. And I said, I'm not doing it. It's going to take me away from the job. And I refused to do it. And they said, but you might get a four. And they were basically on their knees begging me, please, would you do it? And I said, no. Now, there are very few head teachers that are going to take their lives in their hands in that way and say, I refuse to do what Ofsted wants me to do. I'm going to do what's right for the children. And that's ultimately what you're having to decide as a head teacher. So that means then that you are putting people in, in, in jobs that are hard to fill anyway, because nobody wants to be ahead. So you're putting these people in positions where they're putting their livelihood at risk by doing what's right for their children. And the thing is, is that you can't even think what's right for your children because you're constantly talking. What does Ofsted want? What does Ofsted want? And the number of head teachers I've had visit here who say, I'd say, try this, try that. Yes, but what would Ofsted think? But what would Ofsted think? And my reaction is always to hell with Ofsted. What do they, what do we care? Do what's right for your school. Everyone thinks I'm bonkers when I speak like that. And that drives me mad. Now, so what are they being held to account for? Filling out the right kinds of documents. Uh, looking a certain kind of way, uh, ticking various Ofsted boxes. That is not to really hold the school to account. Now, I can understand holding schools to account long distance, you know, um, doing it in such a way so that, uh, you know, you're looking at their data and you're looking at, you know, the results they've got and so on, fine. But guess what? Parents can already do that. So this idea that without the Ofsted report, parents wouldn't know what was going on. All parents know which are the good schools that they want and the bad schools are over there. They already know all this stuff. So you can already find out the kind of results and all that sort of thing. So what is Ofsted really adding? I don't know, I tell you, they're just distracting um, head teachers from doing a good job. And I know that's not Ofsted's intention. And I have to add that Ofsted now in 2021 is the best it has ever been. But just because it's the best it's ever been right now, can we all not forget what it was like in 2009? Because it was a nightmare telling us all to teach the wrong way, telling us all to do all the wrong things and destroying schools, you know, with this, this, this dead hand of bureaucracy that goes across the system. So we mustn't forget 2009. And those people who are really supportive of it now, they forget and they think, oh, well, we really like it. Now under Amanda Spielman, yeah, she's great. Fine, what happens when she quits? I tell you, as an institution, it is a real problem. But I understand, you know, Lucy is much more, um, you know, sensible than I am and much more, uh, you know, in the middle of the road. So she's, she's suggesting things which actually get done, things like getting rid of the outstanding grade, which would be a good one perhaps just having pass and fail. Uh, I said this idea of doing it long distance because I realized we're so wedded to the idea of an inspectorate because we're also convinced that it actually holds schools to account, which it does not, um, that we will never get rid of it. 
Thank you. I think that's possibly the first time I've ever heard Lucy described as middle of the road, which is uh, startling. <laughs> it's all itself. relative, John. Yeah, I mean, yes, so very, very much, very much depends on where you start. Now, yeah. I'm conscious uh, that we are in our closing minutes and that uh, I'm particularly thinking about uh, an audience of um, uh, potential career changes and career changes into teaching and that uh, at times um, through your excellent answers, we may have painted a, a sort of picture of the profession that's not always the most... Um, uh, Flattering. So I'd like to ask both of you in the in, in, in your final contributions, why should anyone become a teacher? And why in particular should people later in their lives who are already successful in other careers become teachers? Why should they do it? What do they add? What what is the the benefit and purpose of having career changes come into the classroom? Um Lucy, what I mean you you've done it. Why do you I think other people should do this? I have indeed. So I'm in my fifth year now. I, I think the best thing is just to tell you what I've been doing today. So today I have been um, teaching year 13s about exchange rates. At the beginning of the lesson, uh, they didn't know the difference between an exchange rate and an interest rate, which seems quite a basic thing not to know, but they did know by the end of the lesson. Um, so that was definitely a tick. Um, I, I was on the cover list. I had to cover a lesson for film studies about psycho, uh, uh, which I enjoyed massively. I learned something myself. Um, I had a double year 12 lesson um, where uh, we were talking about public goods and government intervention and had really interesting discussions. They, because I'm a journalist, I care so much about the news. They, are, they have to come to every lesson of mine with a news story or else I do give them a detention. They absolutely must do it. They must engage with the world. And guess what? Since September, they are all really, really engaging with the world. I taught a year eight maths class um, and that was quite nice. I like dipping my, you know, a bit of a uh, equation of a line, a bit of gradient, a bit of um, coefficients going on there. So that was, that, that was quite fun too. And as if that wasn't enough, I've also been helping students rewrite their personal statements for university. So I'm a little bit knackered now, um, but I really feel that my day has been productive and it's been useful. I can barely think of a single day as a journalist where, where that was the case. You know, you write a Saki newspaper column, so what? Thanks. Uh, Catherine, you know, why, why should they join? What can they add? Because it's the best job in the world. It is the most wonderful thing you could do with your life because as Lucy has just described so beautifully, you change children's lives and you change the world because the way in which we change the world is by changing children. That's where you start. And especially if you work in an environment where the children, you know, wouldn't necessarily get the chance to change their own lives if it weren't for you and, your, you know, the staff around you. It's, um, it is so hard. It is so challenging. You will never do anything so hard. It, it, you have to be bright, you have to be on it, you have to have super amounts of energy, you have to be in bed by 10 o'clock at the absolute latest. 8.30, Catherine, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you, you, you live and breathe it all of the time, you don't think about anything else, it gives you meaning. You know, the thing about other jobs, I don't know, because I've never done anything else, but I sort of, I friends of mine, you know, people buy new washing machines, and they buy new cars and new houses, and they have nice time and they have nice colleagues, but they don't live and breathe it. They don't feel they are changing the world. And the thing that teaching is gonna allow you to do is that when you're 85 and you're on your deathbed, you're gonna be able to look back and say, I did something. I contributed to the world and made it different. I made it better. And that, there's no profession that beats it. It's the best job in the world. And I think on that, thank you to our guests. Uh, Lucy Kellaway and Catherine Burble Singh. Um, I, th I think that's that's all that needs to be said. Thank you both very yeah, much. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, John. Um, just a massive thank you to Catherine, John, and Lucy to all of you for being here this evening and taking time out of your days. And um, there are some closing polls that are just popping up on the screen uh, just to get some feedback on the session um, that we can take on board and now teach. And um, so please do do fill those out. And of course, if you are a career changer interested in coming into teaching, which hopefully you are now after that wonderful those wonderful words from Catherine, um, please do get in touch with now teach uh, and. Uh, give us a call and, and we're happy to chat through with you. Thank you so much for being here this evening and uh, good night.